Thank you, Dhrumil. Uh, should I share my screen? Uh, can somebody allow me to share my screen? Uh, the people from the IT department have to allow me to share my screen. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm just sharing it. Okay. Uh, so, am I audible? Yes, yes. And my slides are visible now? Yes, yes. Fine. So, thank you. Good afternoon uh, to all of you and a very warm welcome for all the delegates uh, on the PSG. And I, before I start with my talk, uh, I must thank uh, Rutul, Dharmendra, both of them, and the team of Dahakar and Bansi sir, and all the faculties and people who have been involved for day and night hard work to create this success. And I'm really happy to be a part of this since the, the beginning of the story. And I would also like to thank Dr. Maulik and Dr. Padmanabh to help me out also for a certain part of the presentation because I believe that this is something which is really very challenging for any diabetologist or an obstetrician uh, to go for. And I will, I will come to know on this case when we discuss out. So I will try my best to complete my talk in, in 15 minutes of case presentation, which is time allotted. So my case presentation today is about the pre-existing type 2 diabetes in pregnancy. Now, friends, let me be very clear that diabetes in pregnancy could be in two parts. Uh, it could be pre-gestational diabetes where it could be a pre-existing diabetes type 1 or type 2 and it could be a gestational diabetes. So what I will be touching today about a case will, will not be about the, the gestational diabetes or type 1 diabetes, but it will be all about the uh, type 2 diabetes in pregnancy, which is pre-existing. And my focus of patient's case would be concerning more about the pre preconceptions counseling and management during the pregnancy, which I believe is more practical to as a take-home message of how practically we deal with the type 2 diabetic patients. Right. So labor and uh, intrapartum and postpartum, already the cases are there in the further. So this would be my agenda today uh, for the talk about the prevalence, why to worry, how the treatment is effective, about the case study, about the counseling, about the therapeutic uh, options of medical nutrition therapy, exercise, and particularly very obviously pharmacotherapy about the insulin and OHA and obviously the take-home message. So before I start with my case, let me have a context to understand about why this case is very important because there are multiple contributors to the maternal fetal complications. According to the FIGO, 127 million live births across the world. So this is one of the top five leading cause of, uh, of maternal and fetal complications. 21 million pregnancies across the world, they are complicated with the hyperglycemia. So prevalence itself is a big challenge. Out of 127 live births per year, nearly 21 million per year are complicated by hyperglycemia alone. And amongst them, 3 to 4 million are detected and treated. Unfortunately, the rest all goes undetected. And the to receive the postpartum follow-up again, the lot of women are lost. So nearly more than 4 million cases in India are occurring. And again, the same amount of people and women, they are going unnoticed. Now, why is this worrisome? Let's understand from the ancient wisdom of India. We all know about the story of Veer Abhimanyu, who had an intro and programming of understanding how to uh, enter into the chakra, but he could not came out. And we all know how what happened to that video. The same has been proven by modern science. And we all know that organogenesis occurs early in the first trimester before the woman even first reports to the antenatal clinic. And by that time, already the organ damage and genetic program is already done. And what complications they come up with if we don't control sugar for this diabetic woman? It would be spontaneous abortion, fetal anomalies, preeclampsia, fetal demise, macrosomia, neonatal hypoglycemia, hyperbilirubinemia, and neonatal respiratory distress. Not only that, a kid in the future also would have obesity, hypertension, and type 2 diabetes. Now, is there any treatment benefit which is associated once you control the sugar? So that's clearly evident by the uh, ECHO study, which says that nearly 1,000 women with GDM were uh, considered for the routine treatment versus the intervention with insulin and so on and so forth. They have found that there is a clinically significant benefit to the women who have been treated with the intensive care group with insulin and other benefits versus the potential complications of non-treating them for the diabetes treatment. So there is a clinical evidence available to benefit this. So with this background and with this understanding, a real life case I'm putting forward to you. Uh, she is 34 year old female, Mrs. Desai, with no previous pregnancy. She came to the diabetes clinic with type two diabetes on OHA. She is overweight. She has PCOD, who is willing to have pregnancy, but not for insulin referred, not willing for the insulin. She is referred by a gynecologist for sugar control and advice. On detailed history, she had diabetes for four years. She had an onset of diabetes at the age of four years, uh, at the age of 30 years, so four years long duration of diabetes. Vitals were pretty normal, except for the BMI was 29.43. So she's 
quite obese, uh, quite ob overweight. Initial invasion, uh, investigation showed fairly uncontrolled diabetes, which is a common story in India because she had never uh, turned back to the uh, proper way of understanding of diabetes and their management. So fasting was 171, post-prandial sugar was about 252, HbA1c was 10.4. She was on metformin 1000 mg BID, glamiparide 1 mg BID, pargritas on 7.5 mg OD, and linagriptin 5 mg OD with combination of empagliflozin 25 mg OD. But unfortunately, she was on irregular medications and she was not following any dietary or exercise uh, advices. She also had PCOD for which initially actually metformin was started two years back before this, and then she turned out to have diabetes and this management was continuing. Now, when she was referred to us, we had a detailed and uh, team-based counseling done for both the par partners. They were explained about the contraception till the HBMC goal of 6.5 is not achieved. Pre-pregnancy evaluation was done. I'm not going into the detail. All the gynecologists know what to be done. So thyroid and TPU antibodies and will come to know if the time permits for the guidelines. Uh, diet counseling was done. Exercise was initiated appropriately. And pharmacological treatment, which was continued, was one. Metformin, one gram BID was continued looking to the PCOD background. And because she had fertility issue also and she was explained to stop on the confirmation of diagnosis but as the as per the patient's willingness and consent upon the gynecologist also she had a determination that she is going to continue for the first trimester because she was not ready for the higher doses of insulin pre-pregnancy uh, on, on detailed explanation she accepted insulin therapy all other OHAs except for the metformin which was stopped she was started with the basal bolus therapy where insulin datami 10 units before breakfast was added and insulin as part which was started uh, which was a fast acting insulin as part uh, which was given pre meal three, three divided doses four four units to start with and smbg was extract, uh, explained she was not pregnant non pregnant at that time so freestyle libre device was also explained and she purchased it and she started using those data with that smbg and freestyle libre device advice uh, we updated her, her uh, basal insulin to 14 minutes before breakfast, datamir, and as part 88 weeks. After three months, when she came back, her fasting was 98, postmenal sugar was 100, and HB1C was 6.6. .6. So with the reasonable control, she she uh, was permitted uh, to stop the contraceptive methods, and she uh, was uh, conceived in time uh, with the IVF a few weeks later. Now, intrapartum management. During the pregnancy, how she was managed? For the first trimester, uh, trimester a patient was offered dis to discontinue metformin, as explained earlier. But with the gynecologist help, she decided that she, with the consent given, she decided that she may continue with the metformin because she was not ready for the very high doses of insulin. Right. So same dose of insulin and metformin uh, were continued, and her SMBG was continued, and she did well. For the second trimester, uh, the injection datamir was updated up to 18 units as a basal, and bolus as part was 10, 10, and 6 units as uh, naturally expected, the second trimester being insulin recommend to go over. And for the third trimester, again, data made was increased up to, uh, was continued to 18 units, but insulin as part requirement reasonably increased to 10, 12, and 4 units. According to the SMBG, this was managed. So these are the details of her investment. I'm sorry for the busy slide, but there are details of her fasting sugar, the post prandial sugars, the random sugars which were measured, HB1C details, and all those parameters which we measure. But to make it very easy for you to understand, these are the graphs of her fasting sugar and postprandial sugar. There was one spike in between. She had chikungunya fever, but fortunately she did well. Uh, that was the time when she had a fast, uh, fasting spike. But if you see the overall tendency from, from 200s to 100s, sugar started going down. This is a graph of her HB1C. Again, when she started was around 10.4, when she ended up was below 7. So this is her, this is her HB1C. So how delivery occurred? She had actually uh, was planned for normal delivery, but she had a cord around neck and uh, because of some fetal distress in the brain, uh, cerebral artery, she was asked to go for the uh, emergency cesarean section. And in fact, it did well. Baby was healthy and uh, with a normal cry, 2.9 kilogram of weight and no other maternal or fetal complications were observed so far. Insulin dose uh, was managed during the delivery and postpartum period as per the guideline. So that was definitely a happy ending. Now, how we could achieve this, this happy ending was absolutely uh, is absolutely based upon the guideline. So, counseling, management, and pre-existing diabetes and pregnancy. So, I would try my best to, to complete my, my, my next few slides just to make a brief history and making understand uh, for the uh, 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 under, uh, how to manage this type 2 diabetes who are entering to the pregnancy. So, pre-pregnancy counseling, in any detail, if I have to explain, we have to educate and obtain maximum cooperation from both the parents. We have to make them explain that HPMC should be less than 6.5. Fasting, uh, 
pre pregnancy should be less than 100 and post prenatal less than 140 this is not during pregnancy the criteria is different as per the dipsy guideline we have to emphasize the need for strict diabetes control and prevent maternal fetal complications we have to check to have thyroid uh, as we discussed in the previous uh, slides also and previous session also tpo antibodies if needed we have to check the immune status against rubella and all entire battery of tests has to be offered which were offered to this patient multidisciplinary approach is mandatory for this kind of patients and these are also endorsed by diabetes care and dipsy and lot of guidelines across the world please 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 remember that uh, these patients are at extreme psychological stress their entire families are at stress and by and large i believe the diabetologists physician or obstetricians whomsoever are involved with this delicate cases are also under psychological stress so unless and until you are you are not very aware words with this kind of handling situation you have to keep in mind that counseling uh, diagnosing depression relieve them for these all issues and giving them assurance is also important so as far as pre pregnancy care is concerned hb1c 6.5 is nearly mandatory canadian guidelines says that at least less than 7 has to be endorsed if patients on the oids uh, it is ideal to switch over to the insulin if pregnancy is planned hypertension control can be done by alternative medications but not by the ace inhibitor arbs and thiazides they are contraindicated uh, detailed retinal examination has to be performed which was performed for this patient but she did well actually but laser photocoagulation is mandatory for somebody who is having long standing diabetes and have a uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy or uh, npdr also renal function creatinine clearance proteinuria management is also important even if patient is dyslipidemic statins are contraindicated so please remember we have to stop and all are endorsed by diabetes guidelines and all dipsy guidelines now as far as brief management i have to explain there are four pillars of management by which we could achieve this patient to have a wonderful uh, outcome of the pregnancy they are medical nutrition therapy exercise insulin and oral anti diabetic agents so what are the basic principles of medical nutrition therapy because this part is going to be discussed by type 1 diabetes gdm or type 2 diabetes or even for the pre diabetic patient entering to the uh, pregnancy so i will be very brief to to just have a outline of this looking to the time uh, constraints so meal plan should be tailor made small frequent meals are always better to avoid hypoglycemia avoid prolonged fasting back time snacks are very important and ensure adequate hydration eight to 10 glass of water per day recommended net weight gain are very very clear in guidelines that underweight patient less than 18 should have a rec uh, recommended weight gain of 11 to 13 kg so on and so forth for our patient who had overweight 24 to 30 bmi 5.5 to 8 kg and she gained around, around 7.5 kg during pregnancy so that's reasonably well energy requirements are also very clear for sedentary moderate or heavy workload pregnant women which could be around 2250 to 3200 kilocalories per day and as far as the underweight and overweight and obese as concerned you can have in plus or minus so 500 to uh, kilocalories per day over and above this and this distribution are as per the recommendation by the routine patients uh, except for the high requirement of some carbohydrate should be deliberately given as far as the your weight is concerned folic acid calcium iron b12 supplementation is also important as far as exercise is concerned the basic principles are very clear that 30 to 45 minutes per day of exercise is is really required uh, you have to break up an extended period for for sedentariness complementary uh, you have to complement dietary recommendations and activities which are increasing the blood pressure like pressure like lifting heavy weights and pushing heavy objects should be avoided otherwise if obstetrician has required uh, as a requirement of restriction of physical activity we have to comply please remember unless and until you have target clear in your mind you won't be able to achieve your goal so it's very clear pre pregnancy hb1c has to be maintained less than 6.5 intra pregnancy monitoring of hb1c is not much validated for a lot of reasons but fasting plasma glucose and this is i'm quoting with the dipsy guideline fasting of 90 post prandial of 120 and mean average of 105 are this is something which we are looking forward we have to try our base to this and please remember don't worry about hypoglycemia because they are very less likely to happen during pregnancy because of the natural hormonal balance and weight gain of the baby or a weight of the baby should be between 2.5 to 3.5 so if you keep these values in your mind you will be able to achieve this monitoring of blood glucose i will just have a one slide at least four times per day smbg is required fasting and three post prandial and after achieving the target you can go for the lab investigation after 28 weeks till once a month 28 to 32 weeks twice in a week more than 32 weeks a week and other parameters also have to be monitored now as far as uh, insulin therapy so i will complete in 3 minutes i, I hope i have 3 minutes uh, this i persons do i have 3 minutes to complete yes yes 
Fine, thank you. So, insulin uh, and FDA pregnancy category. This is slide is very very important because lot of physicians and uh, people have worry about what insulin to be used. So, this is what I have put it from the PubMed, uh, one of the review article. The regular insulin, aspart, and Lispro have category B, right? So, they can be used. They are the short acting insulins, but uh, as far as intermittent acting insulin, NPH is also having category B, and Datamine uh, is one of the choice of insulin because it is one of the only long acting insulin. Which is approved as a category B for US FDA to be used in pregnancy. But lulicin, dagludec, inhaled human insulins, all are category C. And for glargin U100 and glargin U300, we really do not have human data. Previously, it was category C. So whenever you require short acting insulin, my message would be to use aspart. And uh, the, the basal insulin, better to use data. If patient is non affording, you can go for NPH or 3070 preparations. So here is the action profile of the insulin preparations, short acting as part Lispro, glulicin and regular, intermediate acting NPH and long acting would be determined. Preferably, I would hope that some data would come for the glargin or Degludec where they are really more physiological. This slide would be very, very important as a take home message that dose of insulin is trimester specific. This is not a routine physiology of any human being. So initially first nearly 20 weeks, there won't be a major change. Once you have achieved your HPVC level, you may maintain as this happened for this patient in the same trimester. But second trimester under particularly 20 weeks onward, there will be drastic increase and gradual increase in the requirement of the insulin basal and bolus both. But there might be some shortfallings after 36 weeks or steadiness, which you'll observe. So these are the doses guideline. I won't go into the detail of busy slide, but it is as per the week, you can go for 1 to 13 week, for example, 0 0.7 into uh, 0 0.7 uh, unit per kilogram, so on and so forth, up to 1 unit per kilogram. The basic principle remains the same. If your fasting is on higher side, go for incrementing the basal unit. If your post breakfast, post lunch or post dinner sugars are on higher side, you can increase the rapid acting insulin analog before the same way. As far as the insulins are concerned, as I said, insulin analogs are better because they have immediate onset of function. Particularly, I would endorse the, the fast acting insulin as part, uh, which is available as a fiasco because to control the first post hour, one hour uh, pl plasma sugar to, uh, to the range of 140, which is also debatable. But yes, a lot of physicians are also chasing it. This is one of the base molecule to have for. As far as long acting insulin is concerned, I think datamir is only approved. The rest of them are as a uh, off label indications. Premix insulin could be good in the setup where this basal bolus therapy looks complex, but please remember it has its own caveats and side effects. So I would not prefer or recommend it on a higher side unless the issues of understanding by the patient or on a busy OPD, doctor do not, do not have time to spare. And continue, continuous subcutaneous insulin in patient pumps are also good, uh, but the cost is also a disadvantage. So you can use if you are very well versed and patient is affording. As far as the anti-diabetic drugs are concerned, metformin is something which is across the world debatable. Initially, it was continued in the PCOD and then there was 1970s study which showed that there is no major difference in parental outcome. However, there is no major study which are done but one of the study which I would like to discuss in this forum is about the mixed study. The metformin in pregnancy study was done in 751 women with JDM randomly assigned at 20 to 23 weeks of gestation who received metformin versus insulin. The primary composite outcome was that how did this feed well, did, did and how this pregnancy ended up. The results were very promising. 92% of the women continued metformin to the term and 46% needed supplemental insulin. But there was no significant difference in the primary composite outcome as far as the uh, side effects of neonatal or mother is concerned. That clearly says that there are no serious adverse events with this metformin. But what could be the current status? So the final verdict is there are possible concerns for placental transfer of 10 to 16% and neonatal hypoglycemia. Currently, metformin is not accepted as a first-line therapy. It is always insulin. But women on metformin for PCOS may continue the con uh, drug during the discretion as our patient had been continuing. However, more evidences are really needed before metformin can be recommended as a first line of agent during pregnancy. Glibenclamide, big no, high risk of uh, adverse events or outcomes are there. I'm quoting it from the uh, BMJ and other OIDs like uh, the thiazolinated neons, DPP4s and GLP1 and lot others are not, not great for pregnancy because there is no enough evidence. So I'm just concluding my slides. This is the last slide perhaps which I'm going through is women with pre-existing diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes, should attain optimal glycemic target that is HbA1c of less than 6.5 before the conception till then, please follow the contraception. Fasting of 90 and PPBS of 120 while pregnant is very, very mandatory as per the DIPSI guideline. The counseling of both partners, multidisciplinary team approach are very required. Medical nutrition therapy, exercise and pharmacology all are integral part of the treatment. But amongst all the treatment, insulin is the treatment of choice. 
and as far as metformin is concerned for the management uh, you may continue during the pregnancy women who have been receiving it for the pcods for conception but still metformin is still not validated for at least initial first a uh, few weeks of the pregnancy we can quote the mixed study after 20 weeks you may use it to cut down the dose of insulin right so uh, i would end my talk by, by saying uh, professor v uh, sishya's words that diabetes free generation if you really want you have to focus on the fetus for the future so please control your sugars well during the pregnancy as this case had a happy baby and happy mother i wish all of you uh, would do so after this session thank you so much